Hello, welcome. How are you? Are you having a good day, morning, afternoon, evening, night? Well, now it's about to get a whole lot better because we're here to talk about family history and we've got lots to cover. It's our weekly Find My Past Friday session and I am Miko Cleland, this week's host to talk to you about all things genealogy uh, the great new records that have been released on Fire My Past as we do every single week and all of the other things that you can care to name. We have Ellie in the comments looking after everyone and she will be making sure that we all don't descend into chaos. But uh, I think uh, she is going to uh, keep a very tight ship and I don't expect we're going to go too crazy. I see lots of people saying hello from all over the place. I see uh, Joan is saying happy Friday from rainy, cloudy Seattle. I like Seattle very much, so I uh, hope you're keeping it safe, Joan. Uh, I see Linda in Newark and uh, quite bright and sunny, but very blustery. We've had some storms, I think, in Edinburgh. I can still hear the thunder every now and then, so uh, there's definitely a few more coming. Anne is joining from the Gold Coast in Queensland in the middle of the night, so I um, hope you're uh, uh, not being kept up, but... Uh, welcome and thank you very much for joining Claire as well from Australia uh, Roscoe Illinois from Ellen and uh, William is saying it's uh, monsoon season in Cumbria so lots and lots going on sunny at least in Harrogate so that's good and uh, sunny with a few showers in a few places I see there uh, I see Linda saying ciao and um, hi to all from Sudden Downs Boy in Salisbury it seems that the weather has really changed welcome to British summertime and uh, of course, what better thing can you do in rainy weather than to spend some time hanging out indoors, doing some family history. So very, very exciting there. Lots of people saying hello and more and more people talking about everything they can. It seems everyone's having wind, rain. Uh, Louise is saying she's in Edinburgh as well. She heard the thunder. I think it might have stopped for now, but uh, keep your eyes peeled. We might even hear the same thunderclack uh, when uh, that goes off, uh, Louise, depending on how close you are to me. Uh, I see Angel in Salmour in France, and uh, everyone's having these storms, so uh, what I want. As long as the internet doesn't go, and then we're all safe. But uh, thank you very much for joining. I see Sean as well from New Zealand. It's great. Nice to see you, cousin. And uh, I'm uh, very happy that you're all here today. So the first thing we're going to talk about, as we usually do, is the new records released this week. Last week we had a bumper crop from Scotland and as what happens every single week, new things, new places, some of them might be exactly what you're looking for. So if you have relatives in Halifax in Yorkshire, this is going to be of interest to you. We've added over 9,000 new school records from there. Very, very exciting, very interesting. Uh, our massive collection of school registers, national collection, the largest online brilliant for finding details because you'll find the names of parents you'll find addresses you'll make sure you've got the right kind of person there and one thing that you should always do when you find a school register is take a look at the corresponding logbooks which we have as well and those logbooks give you lots of detail about the class what they studied what they were doing and it might also have your ancestors named in there too so really useful bit of extra information you can find using those records we also have and very useful to me, of course, but I am not biased and uh, I didn't have a hand in this. Some new Staffordshire Parish registers. Uh, we've got a few additions for our massive collection there of parish registers from Cabers Wall, St. Peter, Chebsey, All Saints, Checkley, St. Mary and All Saints, and the useful one for me, Tipton, St. Mary. So these are filling in some gaps and making sure we have a much, much deeper, broader collection of Staffordshire Parish Registers. We are very proud of that collection. They have original images as well to look at. Really, really exciting. You have some Staffordshire ancestors. Now, it's list time again. We're going to talk about those newspapers every week. There are new newspapers, and this week there are some really exciting special interest titles. So hold on to your hats. We're going to begin. I'm going to take a deep breath and then get started. We have the Aurora Borealis of 1821, the Constitution of London from 1818 to 1819, the Empire News and the Umpire, 1884 to 1895 and 1897 to 1911, the General Evening Post from 1801 to 1813, 
1818 to 1822, The Instructor and the Select Weekly Advertiser, covering 1810 to 1811 and 1813 to 1814, The London Evening Post, 1805 to 1806, The London Journal and Pioneer Newspaper, 1845 to 1846, The London Moderator and the National Advisor, 1813, 1818 to 1819, The London Phalanx, 1841 to 1843, The Observer of the Times, 1821 to 1822, the Public Cause, 1811 to 1812, 1814 to 1816, The Standard of Freedom, covering 1850 to 1851, The Taylor and Cutter, great special interest paper relating to the tailoring industry, 1866 to 1868, 1879 to 1918, The True Sun, covering 1832 to 1837, and the Wooler's British Gazette of 1819. Now, in addition to those brand new titles, we have added some more years to a few more. Boxing, which of course, as you might imagine, it's about boxing. Englishman, 1803 to 1809, 1812 to 1813, 1816 to 1834. You can imagine it's probably going to be about Englishmen. Uh, the Morning Herald from London, 1853 to 1863, uh, eight and 1863. The Oxford Chronicle and the Reading Gazette, 1918 and 1920. The Press of London, 1860. The Sporting Chronicle, very nice sporting paper there, 1874, 91, 97, 1902, 1904 to 1905, and 1921. And finally, but by no means least, the Swindon Advertiser from 1930. 13. So a huge crop of that, 15 brand new papers, seven with additional content, and those are fantastic, not only for your local interests, lots of special interests too. Love the tailor and cutter, already found a relative of mine in there. It seems, you know, we've got a, uh, a great Cleland who was a tailor in there. Not a famous one, not any very particular note, but it's the sort of place that these people go and hear their industry news. And so you'll find people being noted in there, people of interest and things that might have happened that might be of interest to other tailors. So a great place to look. And then, of course, newspapers from London, always good. Newspapers from around the rest of the country, really great fun. And don't forget that stories were syndicated. So you will find your ancestors in these, perhaps even if they're not from the places that we've just mentioned, because if a story is worth telling, it's worth spreading. And you'll find these people inside all of these papers, perhaps. So do go back to those newspapers every month or so and make the same searches and see what results come back. And you might well find yourself in luck. So great to uh, see those new papers. And hopefully that will really, really help. So uh, let's see what's coming through in the comments as we're going. And seeing uh, more people talking about the weather. That's good. See the same again from everywhere. And um, it sees uh, Lloyd's in Nova Scotia. That's good. See some people saying there. Um, do we have logbooks for London schools? We tend to have logbooks for as many schools as we can. So if you go into that national collection, you're able to search by register or by logbook. Logbooks are most often browsable. I would use that more often than I would search. But I would definitely, if you've got the register, take a look for the logbook too. And fingers crossed. And uh, see what we've got here. And Sally's already had a look. I'm pleased to see that Taylor and Cutter and more Oxford newspapers. That's great stuff because they are really, really great and really exciting. And uh, I see some more requests for some newspapers. I see Lloyd wants uh, the Hoys Dublin Mercury. We add so many newspapers. There's definitely a chance we can add that. But uh, definitely there'll be more every single week and we'll get there eventually. There's a room I say a room, it's more like a, a warehouse of all of these newspapers. And, you know, we can start at one place and work backwards, but it's very difficult to specifically know exactly, uh, you know, what we, we're doing because there's so many. We try and get a fair spread of as much as we can. We pick from this and try to be as even and fair as we can. But uh, there's so much, it's more than you could ever hope to do in a lifetime. So we just got to try our best to just get there and get them done quickly. And there will definitely be some great new newspapers on the way. And some of them I think you'll be very excited by. So uh, very, very exciting too. I see 
Here we go. Let's see what else we have. Uh, Sylvia said the Taylor and Cut has a great few snips about vaccination, including one pointed out by Audrey Collins, a company insisting all employees vaccinated, even though the law had changed by this time to permit conscientious objection. That's interesting. That's a story as well. Anna saying that she has some tailors in her heritage as well. That's great. So uh, I think uh, that was a good choice there. So that's good. I see Jane as well saying tailors and cutters, good for her. There's a really good uh, newspaper as well I quite like called the Cotton Factory Times that we put up relatively recently and that's quite exciting and that's uh, those people who worked in the cotton mills and the cotton industry so that these are really really exciting when you can get in and not just look at local papers but look at papers that relate to the occupations your ancestors had and the things they did because even if you don't find your ancestors names you can find out a lot about how they lived and what they did which is also great because that social history in that context is all important into telling that whole full story so always very exciting and uh, i see lots and lots of people talking about the other different things here we've got here lots of answers to the question of the week the question of the week we asked was a very special one, a one at least true to my heart, is uh, what are the locations that appear most in your family tree? What are the locations that appear most in your family tree? And there is one great way to find this really easily. If you have a find my past tree, it's one of my favorite little features. I really enjoy it. And I'll just go through the steps to recreate that now. If you didn't do it when we met on Wednesday, I did describe it, but you can do this so you can join in so if you go to your find my past tree you can do it with your uploaded gedcom you don't have to have you this is your main tree or anything but you can do this really useful the way you can do this and you'll see at the top next to the search bar when you say find someone on this tree you'll see a little cog that says tree settings if you hover over it when you click on that you'll get some tree settings and then if you click again on the top right there's another box that says tree settings with a little down arrow and you click on that and you'll get a list that comes down and on that list there's one that says places and when you press places you'll have a number of all of the different places on your family tree and then you can click on each column and you can order them by whichever you're looking at so i click on that usage and I can then sort all of the places in my family tree by how often they've been used. And then you'll get a big list of front runners and you'll see where your family tree is perhaps uh, bushiest. And you'll see the locations that really matter to your family by doing that without having to use your subjective mind we can get some stats and some facts and we can say exactly where these things are so it's great to see if there's a top five places or anything else i see some other people talking about uh different things we've got going uh, i see william's got macclesfield and leak relatives uh 15 1700s in macclesfield leak in the 1800s uh, I see Andrew say most of his ancestors came from within 10 miles of where he was born. So that's quite good. Um, but to her surprise, her mum's maternal line came from around Whitehaven. Any chance of Cumberland records? There are definitely some Cumberland records I know on the way at some point. So watch this space and hopefully they might be able to help you. And uh, we've got some great things there. And I see people talking already if they had the same area so they might have some names especially uh, macclesfield I said, so that's interesting uh, i have a an uncle that lived in macclesfield and someone from the macclesfield branch of the cheshire family history society really helped me out and took a photograph of his old house which i think is now a I think it's a Malaysian restaurant, I think, but it was very interesting. Uh, they ran a news agent's uh, a paper shop. Uh, I had a paper shop once, but it blew away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stop with the terrible jokes and uh, keep on with uh, the family history. I see some other people mentioning other different locations. Jackie has some Kent, Worcestershire, Shropshire and South Africa. Carol has got Mould, Horden and Buckley, all in Flintshire, not going too far away. Uh, see some others and uh, Claire said can we repeat those instructions to find a common location so you can always look watch these things back remember but also say if you go to your tree on your tree at find my pass there's a little cog in the top corner click on that cog it says tree settings and when you go to your tree settings you'll see again in the top right tree settings press on that and it'll be a little drop down there'll be a thing that says places click on places 
and then you can sort by any column that you click on. You click on usage and it will order by the most used. So that will get you to what you need. I see some other people have been doing this. And if you can't do this or you haven't got your tree on fire past or anything, still tell us what, what are the most common places in your tree uh, or the ones that you know of. So Karen has got Manchester, Melbourne in Derbyshire, Glossop, Gorton in Manchester and Leeds in Yorkshire, all in one place. It's good. Ashford in Kent. Uh, Glasgow in Lanark as well. So it's great. That's so really uh, quite a spread there. Quite one. And I see Linda. She's uh, gone with the facts. St. Pancras in London, 281 times. Islington, 260. St. Pancras in Middlesex, 224. So you say that you'll need to sort. That's what's quite exciting with this because if you click on the little pencil next to your location, you can alter all of those locations at once. So if you've decided that you want to change what one of those is written as, so you see there, you've got St Pancras London, St Pancras Middlesex, choose whatever you think is most appropriate and you can block change all the rest. So they all merge into one, all these different locations all become the same. And that means that then you can see things a little more easily and you can neaten up your tree. So I like to go in here and make sure I find that place, county, country is my preferred format when it comes to location. So I like to make sure everything's all nice and neat. And uh, I see so many people with people who are um, in the same places. So I'm hoping maybe we want to make some connections today. Uh, Matthews Parish is a fairly spread out. Kent, Dorset, Devon, Sussex, Surrey, London, Wiltshire, Ireland and Berkshire. Lines in Shropshire, Yorkshire and other places. You are a truly cosmopolitan chap, Matthew. That's interesting. Uh, Georgia has uh, Clerkenwell, Hackney and Islington. All very close together. I see, and uh, I see Janine has got uh, County Cork, West Cork, and East Cork. So uh, there we go. So maybe the uh, the two met at some point. That's interesting. Uh, Keith Ness, that's a great part of the world to be from. Trisha, that's great. Lots of people from Stockport, Warrington, Lancashire, all these things. Diane has uh, Edinburgh, Leith, Tranent, South Leith, Coatbridge, and Manchester. So very, very Edinburgh focused there. So hopefully our new Scottish records will help. And there are some great Edinburgh records coming soon also that might be of use. And of course, Ellie and I being in Edinburgh at the moment are keeping Edinburgh safe for you as well, making sure that when all of this travel is allowed, you can come back and you can uh, visit your ancestors and everything will all still be in one piece. And uh, see, William is tracing relatives in Kensington and Mayfair. And uh, Maureen's got Pembrokeshire and Pembrokeshire, and so it goes on her side. So that's interesting. I see uh, Sue has got Curry and Colin, uh, Brighton in Sussex, Hove, Lewisham, St Pancras. It's interesting how we have these branches that sort of cluster together, but they come together and they're from completely different parts of the world sometimes. I know mine. Um, I see uh, I know Jackie's got Clack Manon. That's interesting. And uh, you should definitely take a look at our modern and civil deaths and burials because we added burials for all of Clack Manonshire only a couple of weeks ago. And they're really, really useful, as well as that national collection that we did. Uh, I see other people there who got, oh, that's a nice one there, Joan. Renfrewshire, Dumfries, New Cumnock and Shetland. Uh, we just added a great set of uh, New Cumnock baptisms. They're in the Luger Church, and um, they are from the Cumnock History Group. They're a part of our new collection, so very, very exciting. Uh, Louise hasn't got a full tree on fire past yet, but top four current places, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Dundee, and Nottingham. Those are four wonderful places that I can get behind. I should probably join the game myself as well. So uh, my top five to show how incredibly diverse and strange family history can be. Uh, I have Del Rye in Ayrshire, and that's in Scotland, 895 times that's been used. Uh, Gela in Caltanissetta in Sicily, 581 times. Darleston in Staffordshire, and uh, that's been 349 times. St Austell in Cornwall, 346 times. And St Stephen in Brannell in Cornwall, 335. And then we've got some more spreading down from before, down there, Hamilton in Lanarkshire, Tyred Reth in Cornwall, Swansea, uh, Shiskin, which is on the Isle of Arran. That's next down 200 times, and it goes down Glasgow, Cumnock, Kilburnie, all of these great parts of the west of Scotland, and it keeps going down and down. Woolen Hall is in there for Staffordshire, lots and lots of things. So you can see some patterns coming through, and then there are a few Welsh connections coming in down at the bottom with Wrexham and uh, a few places in Flintshire, which hopefully then maybe we'll find some more about that branch of the family at some point. And I see lots and lots of people who are finding they've got relatives in the same areas as other people. So that's great. Keep talking to each other about that. Maybe you will have some shared names or some shared bits of information that you could 
swaps. That's great. And uh, Claire saying that they had, they learned something while they were doing this exercise. They've got Portsmouth, Portsea, and Gloucester, and they've got Belfast, Kinross, and Cardiff. That's a great selection. It's really, really exciting. And uh, I see Janine is saying, how terribly strange it is for an American to hear of locations as parishes, except for people in Louisiana. It's one of those uh, wonderful quirks of doing research in different countries that you have to get used to all of these different description names of all these different places, whether they're townships, whether they're states, counties, uh, provinces, all these different things. Um, we may be referring to very similar things, but we have our own lingo, our own talking uh, ways of doing things over and over. So really, really, really useful uh, to get your head around all these different things. I see uh, uh, lots of people talking about this. Uh, Fia said, do I have any Lawson ancestors? You might have to tell me where from, but it looks like <laughs> maybe once again, the curse has struck and, um, oh, I say curse, so it's more of a blessing really, but uh, I, might, I might end up with some more <laughs> cousins from this presentation. Every single time there's a final on Fast Friday, I meet a new cousin and uh, it's a very, um, very fun tradition. And uh, said, by the end of this, eventually, I think we'll all be related. Uh, so uh, <laughs> let's see, you have to tell me where yours are from, Fee. Uh, maybe it's your turn. And uh, Karen has Lawson from Scotland as well. So maybe there's um, a larger selection. Um, Jackie has got five Persh and Dumfries. No luck so far with the new records. We do have some great ones from Dumfriesia and some good ones there. Um, Dumfries is definitely one that we enjoy. My great, great grandfather was from Dumfries. Uh, Ellie's ancestors also from Dumfries. Really, really exciting place to go. I loved going to Dumfries. And, and if I hadn't gone there, I wouldn't have known enough about the area that really helped me. I went to the Dumfries and Galloway Family History Society, great bunch of people. They helped me out a little bit with my tree, but also I got my head around the geography because Dumfries, as you may imagine, that the town is maybe in the centre of a county or nowhere near a county border. There's a river, and on the other side of that river is a completely different uh, place, Maxwell Town, I think, and that's in a different county as well. So that makes things quite difficult when you can see, you can be in Dumfries, which is a relatively built-up part, and then you can just cross a bridge and be in a different town and county. And once you understand that, you can uh, understand a lot more about where you can find records and things. So that little bit of local knowledge really, really helped me, and that was very, very useful. Andrew saying, I am brew. <laughs> we are in Scotland, Andrew. So uh, when in Rome, we must. And uh, uh, I see uh, Mary has Dublin, Fermanagh, South Africa, Middlesex, and Germany. That's quite a mix. So one there. And um, I see Sally's got some tailors. The guy ranch the family from Portsmouth. All of them were tailors. So hopefully that tailor and cutters can be really, really useful. It is fantastic to see all these great places. Uh, Sylvia saying Dumfries has a fascinating connection to inoculation in the 18th century. A doctor there was one of the earliest inoculators. Dumfries has a great collection of parish records. So they're on, on Farmer Past. And we have a great collection of monumental inscriptions from there too. Very useful. I've solved some mysteries myself with that collection that we have online. Really great, useful. And then uh, Karen as well, born in Dumfries. It seems like this is the place to be this week, everyone. Maybe we should have to do a, a guest slot from Dumfries and just maybe uh, see if we can get that arranged. I see um, Fee has uh, some, uh, let's see, the Lawson's in Glasgow going back to Keir in Dumfries. So I have to take a look at my tree to see um, where uh, where my Lawson's are. But uh, it's nice to see other people have people with the same names and things like that. Anne has asked an interesting question. She has Guy ancestors. Do you know if this was originally a French name? So the thing about surnames and surname origins, really important to know and understand, is that there can be multiple origins of the same name. Just because you have a certain name doesn't mean that you're all in the same family. Sometimes they can independently arise with completely different reasons. So it's one of those things that you really have to start researching, going backwards and see what happens often your name may have converted into the name that you you have now uh, through some other reason. And so my Rennies from Dumfries uh, began as Rain, R-A-I-N. And that's one thing that they changed over about a generation and a half. They slowly shifted from Rain to Rainy to Rennie. And Rennie is a much more common name. So and then, then they sort of disappear into the wilds a little bit. But that's one of the big things that your name may not be 
the name that you have now. It may have changed. And then also, um, there might be different reasons. Guy could be a patronymic, could be related to someone who is, you know, the son of someone called Guy. Uh, it could be Anglo-Norman. It could have been here for a thousand years. It could be something like Huguenot. It could be someone who came in the past 500 years. There are many different places and times that your family could have arrived in Britain. And so it's worth doing that research and working backwards and not taking a surname origin for uh, a truth until you've managed to dig a little bit further in and find things for yourself. One thing that is really useful that I do like sometimes is there are some great uh, things that you can plot surname distributions and you can see where the most common areas for certain surnames are. And that can sometimes give you an idea as to these clusters of a certain surname might give you an idea of certain independent origins of this name or certain independent families and especially if the name is quite rare you can see quite a lot there as to where these people are see victoria has reigns as well ah oh. <laughs> every time it's uh, one of those things all of these cousins coming through uh, so uh, nice to see you as well victoria and uh, we'll have to have a look at that if they're from um mine appeared in dumfries and we don't know where they came from originally so they're somewhere in that sort of area but not sure where because they arrive at just a sort of census period. They've been there for about 20 years or so. So a bit stuck then. And uh, back at the Dumfries Library in the archive there, I think they said that it was a name that was common in, I think it was around about um, Kukubri, I think, around that sort of area. It's definitely a southwestern Scottish name, but uh, I'll have to dig into that some more. I see uh, Sarah's uh, majority of her answers are Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire, but also Bamshire, uh, Murray, Invernessshire, a Penny Creek, and a tiny ranch in Wigtonshire. So definitely you have tartan blood there, Sarah, and uh, a very, very nice mix. Some great stuff there for Aberdeenshire as well. I love our poll tax. You might have a look at our um, presentation on Wednesday. It might be able to help you with some of the new Scottish records. You can go back and watch that if you weren't there live, and hopefully that will help you get the best out of those new Scottish records we published recently. I see uh, Jackie saying Bishop Stortford, the most numerous place, Chelmsford and Braintree second and third. So very, very Essex there. That's interesting. And uh, I see Andrew there making the point as well. His Halsteads became Alstead in 1991. It became Alston. So that exactly shows how that goes through. You see, it can change generation by generation. Perhaps one person can change it themselves. It just varies. Sometimes it's down to spelling mistakes, all kinds of different things. And it is one of those really, really interesting things um, that is worth digging into. But remember to support it with your research and with everything that you can find. And uh, I see Beth saying those spelling mistakes and variations make it more interesting to add to the mix when you're trying to find family members. Interesting question, which I don't really have a, a great best practice answer for you. But let's imagine your family have changed their surname over centuries. What would you do in your family tree? And this is probably a matter of opinion. So uh, I think there might be equal equal uh, choices here. But so if you have, let's say, um, Smith and Smith dropped an E over time, uh, would you, when you get back to those earlier ancestors, would you list them with the same surname that they have now? Or would you list them with the original surname they had, which is different so that they're not the same surname, but you've got the surname that they were recorded when they were found. Uh, the same if someone is born with one surname and dies with another because of the changing, what would you do there? What name would you put in? That's one of those interesting questions. And I think there isn't a the right answer, but I'm really curious to see what you think. So I see Ali said the original surname for her as they were recorded. That's how she would do it. Really interesting. I think uh, it's difficult to uh, have a right answer, but I'm really fascinated to see what people might think. And um, I see uh, Andrew's got people in Wagon Overthrow near Nuneaton, but not the surname. I thought for a minute you might be related to Ellie, and that would have been an interesting one. But uh, there'll still be some time. And uh, see, um, Janet says, so many spellings and mistranscriptions of Quarry. Well, that's one of those ones as well. And uh, Mary says, why did people change their surnames? They have an ancestor that started off with the surname How, morphed to How with an E, then remarried and became Harris. Seems odd and suspicious. It's often quite innocent, Mary. It 
can be for a number of reasons, down to the lower literacy rates at the time, perhaps down to different accents. If someone had moved, sometimes it's harder to understand what people are saying because you're more used to the local accent. You might have uh, then copied it down differently. Uh, there are thousands of different reasons and not all of them are suspicious or have a racy story behind them. Sometimes it's just down to the fact that um, you know things got better over time in terms of how people could read and write. Um, there is still a long way to go uh, to get to the modern day. So there are plenty of opportunities for these things to happen. So I would definitely um, not read too much into it unless you can find some great records to support that. But uh, definitely interesting. I see Karen would also put the original when she's writing things down in a uh, tree. And uh, Linda, just like me, you agonize over it and usually wimp out and make a note. That's exactly what I do. And uh, that's uh, one of those ones. Um, Matthew, as recorded as well, seems like there's a big thing there. Uh, Carol lists both of the surnames. Preferred is the one used most often, very similar to me. Uh, Sylvia, as recorded as well. And um, see, uh, Beth would list them with the surnames on the original documents and put in alternative surnames as you find them. Very good practice there. Anna uses the surname that was recorded. If it's another, they'll put in an alternate name. And Karen always names the family with the first name spelling because they can find then add a K E. That's good. Uh, Linda, always the original, as down at the time. I see the difference is then when you try and search for these people, you have to remember when the surname changed and that sort of thing. So it, there are advantages and disadvantages to each method. I see William saying in the record, he's found Shaw and Shaw for the same family with an A. I keep them as that so you can see the change in dialects over the years. That's really good. And uh, Tony matches his surname to the record found with a note to link the future name. That's an interesting one. And uh, see some more there, um, as recorded by Joan. And uh, so uh, that's one difficult thing there. And Victoria has Andre. Many official records don't place the accent on the E. Many future generations have also dropped the accent. That's a common thing, particularly when we're looking at transcribing and things. Sometimes it's not mentioned or noted. And sometimes when someone is writing down, maybe an official won't actually put that detail in. So it can be hard. I have FAMA. Uh, in my family, which the A has got an accent on there. So it's more of like a FAMA. But um, it's it's another one of those things that sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. So you have to think about how you would do that too. Uh, Judith would keep the original name. Um, and it's really interesting to see the different uh, spread of answers. But it seems that a lot of people had things as recorded. And uh, it's uh, very, very interesting. And uh, Anne has the original surname that they use, might have to change one next to it, like that Smith and Smith uh, with a, a, a hash sort of thing, a, a slash in between. And uh, Beth has a great, great uncle who's found three different spelling variations for his middle name, Molyneux. Also Molyneux with an I, and they can't remember the third spelling. That's a big one, so it can happen quite a lot. Uh, it is one of those big things that we have to get through. And uh, Ellie has a Molyneux ancestor from Cheshire, and she's got first-hand experience of how much that spelling varies. And it can be difficult, particularly when you have those uh, names that are less common. So people who are writing these things down don't have as much experience in seeing what they are. So it can be a little harder to, to write down, uh, again, because these people aren't um, massively proficient at reading and writing for the most part because they didn't go to school until much later. So they would have learned to read and write in Sunday school. They would have had a kind of elementary education somewhere else, perhaps privately. See, Ivy puts the original in brackets, then the surname it changed to. Uh, really interesting. And uh, there we go, Sarah. A default spelling to as they are now has a section within their offline tree that records the variants. Even though there might be a Stuart. Uh, EW in one record, they're a UA steward in another, so it's impossible to have the right spelling. It's a big point there, very, very true. Um, and uh, Ruth has that uh, the Gallic problem there. The Scottish ancestors who started off as Mahag and ended up becoming Marks, they use the name as recorded and use AKA for the changes. Now, one thing that also comes up, which is less commonly known and definitely much harder for genealogists, is that some parts of the Highlands were still using patronymics, even up to the 1700s. And that can get very, very confusing because you have a different surname every generation, which is very, very difficult. But uh, I've seen that in records, luckily not in my own tree, so I haven't had to deal with that too closely, but it's very, very awkward. And uh, there we go. Um, so Karen's got an ancestor as McCanbury on a birth certificate, as her mother's maiden name. Uh, her marriage certificate was McCanbury, and other children's birth certificate had her name as a mix of variations of the spelling. 
McCanvary was another, so she just made a note of all the spelling variations. That's good. It's nice to at least have the information with you and to hand. Any bit of information is useful. Really, really important to get hold of it all because you never know when it can come in handy. So always make sure you copy as much as you can in here. See lots of people with the spellings. And um, Matthew say many spellings with or without an E at the end. Um, so they put that in the brackets. Um, Smith is recorded as Smith and E. Den is, uh, they put the N and the E in there as well. And Nether Soul were the same way because of the differences that come in. And uh, of course, you could not go any wrong with using wildcards, which again, I talk about them every single week and they're really important. But uh, wildcards will help you get to these extra different spelled surnames. So make sure you use those as well. Remember the asterisk and remember the question mark and those things will help you. Put an asterisk in, it could mean any number of letters or no letters at all. Put that at the end of your surname and it will pick it up whether it has an E at the end or not, for example. And the question mark when you don't know what the letter may be, but you know there's a letter there and you know it's one letter. So that's also really useful too. And uh, Derek is saying, given the number of times my surname is misspelled by people today, he finds it incredible that all the records in his parental line all the way back to the 1600s are consistent in the spelling. That's a good point. It can be uh, perhaps down to the uh, the local uh, traditions of knowing these surnames, but also, you know, it's uh, a little bit of luck and judgment. So uh, you're definitely uh, lucky in some ways. I see Sean saying any variation of Clelland is a spelling mistake. It's the present Clelland. Uh, it's the spe present spelling. And I found that as well, Sean. I, I, I know that for a generation or so, our ancestors were Clelond, and um, that didn't last very long. And uh, they have dropped an L now and then. And uh, yeah, I, I consider there aren't many uh, Clellans with the two L's and we're all usually related. We're all part of the same bunch. So uh, definitely when you find the other ones, it doesn't tend to stick around. It tends to be a misspelling on the part of uh, whoever wrote things down. So it's a good point. And uh, I see Matthew and Jane saying they love using wildcards. Jane says they use wildcards a lot and uh, a really big thing there. Really, really useful to use them. Uh, Beth is saying it doesn't help when you're looking for someone they're known by one name, but officially they were named something else. That is one of those awkward questions, isn't it? Oh, I wish I had something to uh, uh, to recommend there. You have to really search with both. Uh, Patricia's got one of her ancestors named John Pritchard, but a lot of these records were Pritchard. And then on two of his daughters used the patronymic name of Jones. Very confusing. Well, I mean, unfortunately, changing your name is very, very easy at this kind of point in history. You could change it officially. You look in the Gazette, and we do have the Gazette online, so you might find the name change in there. But there's no obligation for that to happen. So those name changes aren't often listed. People can just decide to use a different name, and that is a little more difficult to keep track of. So do check the Gazette, but uh, see how you get on. And uh, Lloyd has his Clellans there, Clellan with one L. So possibly quite far back, you may be related to uh, myself and Sean. But uh, so far, all the Clellans that I've been uh, going for, apart from these uh, small forays, of which they're one L for a little while, um, haven't connected back to the one L group yet. They're all still with two Ls hanging around and uh, making uh, mischief usually around about North Ayrshire. So uh, there they go. And then they spread out to Lanarkshire as well later on. But uh, some great new Clellans now added to my tree thanks to the new records that came through last week. And I've been adding in some more things. I took some extra time. And isn't it lovely when you can set some time aside and just do some family history and say, right, I'm going to have a look. And you go to your tree and you'll see the new hints appear or anything like that, or you'll just start kicking around in the new records and see See what comes back put in the surnames that you know and see what comes back and hopefully you'll find something new but even if you do something small something little just as we talked about places today if you can improve some place locations that might give you some new hints or some better hints improve because the location is better in your tree or maybe you look in one place or something just when you have a spare moment. It's still just pushing things forward that little bit more. And it's nice to say you've done something to your tree this week or something like that. So it's really, really useful. So I'm very into that. And I've been uh, trying to uh, go through as many hints as I can just to get them cleared off and uh, see if there's any great uses in there. And I have found some good ones, particularly in the new collections that we've added. But also it's been nice to see that fresh tree where the hints have been accepted 
uh, or rejected. Uh, I can see lots and lots of people uh, in those tree to tree hints as well. I've sent some messages this week. So uh, I've been hoping to connect with some distant relatives in the same way, always useful. Sometimes it takes a little while for those replies to come in. So if you keep sending these messages to different people, then uh, you'll never know when the next one might come in. So uh, always nice to have more than one iron in the fire. And it's always nice to have something to be waiting for as well. I like to make sure I've always got something ordered. And uh, I do like those England and Wales probates. £1.50 still at the moment, really useful. Make sure maybe one of those is waiting or something. So there's something to look forward to so that I definitely know that I'm moving forward a little bit each time. I see uh, Ronnie has got an answer for us. Um, her father's family are all very specific places with many generations from each area. Thurso, Wick and Staxigo in Kate Ness, the McLeod and Stewart families as Coopers making for the herring fishery and shopkeepers. They're moving down to the east end of London in Stepney, Bethnal Green and Mile End for one side, Greenwich, Deptford and Bromley in Kent, women working as staymakers and milliners, <coughs> Men as warfingers with marriage into the Walker family who were all builders, plumbers, and late. I think they'll be carrying on, so we'll see what else comes through. But it's interesting, isn't it, when people move to these bigger cities and go from there. And um, When we launched these Scottish records last week, we had a great launch event and we had a presentation uh, from the uh, inestimable Brian Cox, the actor that you'll know from many different Scottish films and, of course, from that great drama series Succession at the moment. And he mentioned a lot about those who came to Dundee to work in the jute mills. And he talked about how Dundee was overwhelmingly employing women and they call it she-town because of the fact that most of these women were working in these jute mills. And the men didn't really have much to do. They they were house husbands, very early house husbands. They called them kettle bilers. And uh, they stayed at home. And, of course, the only thing they could really do was drink. So there was a big problem with uh, alcoholism and things like that in that sort of period of time in Dundee, in Scotland. And getting that little bit of context and a bit of understanding really does help to uh, frame what you're thinking and what you're seeing uh, when you see things in a census so you see the records and you say okay well if i understand the context the knowledge then maybe that might help me understand what my ancestors lived through as well heather found lots from scottish records lost track of time last night they got to bed at quarter to four wow and that is a good research session heather that's a fantastic one and i uh, have not done that in a while but i'm definitely sure it will come again and uh, it's great when you get onto a a uh, hot streak and you start searching finding these great things and uh, uh, getting really excited about what you might find and whenever you've got a, a bit of a clue then uh, sometimes it's really hard to put down so uh, definitely enjoy those i see um katie has uh, ancestors in colonial british america to glassery and argyleshire and then to many parts not yet explored yet the english irish and welsh sides of her family so there's you've got plenty more to learn and plenty more records to explore soon so that's going to be fun for you so uh, definitely don't leave that one too long because when you get into some uh, of our wonderful parish records they are really exciting seeing that original handwriting seeing someone who stood in front of your ancestor and uh, was there present at one of those big life events the moments in your history that make you who you are all seen by someone written down you can see every single pen mark it's beautiful really emotional moment so uh, there we go so uh, a great uh, tip from ellie to help out her descendants she's going to do the scottish way she's going to have a scottish tradition she's going to make overthrow her middle name when she gets married next year so that's interesting it's good i love that scottish tradition of having your maternal maiden name as your middle name and often sometimes you'll have two middle names you'll have two maternal surnames and uh, that's really really useful because you may end up with your mother's surname and your grandmother's surname and that really helps when it comes to family history i know my grandfather does the same thing and that's such a useful thing to make sure you're on the right track so really really perfect and really useful I see uh, lots and lots. Ellen's DNA says Scottish. The research, not so much. Looking forward to finding the elusive Kirby family in Scotland. So fingers crossed you do uh, do some success in that. But uh, yeah, it can be difficult. Always take DNA with a little bit of a pinch of salt when it comes to those locations that it says you're from until you've got some records to triangulate it and match things up. So uh, see how things go, but always rely on the records and use the DNA to uh, support. So it's a great extra tool but it's not the only tool. We have to use them both if we want to use them. And uh, I see some more people with uh, some possible connections. I see uh, Trisha's uh, talking to Ronnie that her family's from Caithness back to the 1600s. 
And so we've got a nice bit of uh, Keith Ness showing. Carol also, her granny McLeod, lives in Libster in Keith Ness before she married her grandpa Turpy from Persia. It's for her father, Angus McLeod, from the Isle of Harris. So that's quite a one. And um, it is great. And uh, I see uh, Ellie is again saying that she found a Scottish name when she least expected after a DNA test. Turns out my great grandmother Smith family were from Birmingham and Dumfriesshire originally. And again, then she then went to record and proved it all because she's a diligent and fantastic genealogist. And uh, I will say that in great support of all of the hard work that it takes to prove one of these interesting hunches. Once you can add your DNA, you can add the records and you can come back with a hard fact, something that you know that you can say that's definitely me. And that's really, really exciting and really, really useful. So I remember uh, seeing her on that journey and uh, it was a wonderful thing to watch to see uh, all the success she was having by doing all of the best things that she could, all the best practice. It was a great thing. And of course, Ellie being Scottish is to be expected, I think, as you've met her. And I think she is uh, a true Scot, especially not only living here, but in personality, in outlook and everything else. I think um, if there were ever someone who uh, deserved that title more, I think it is her. And uh, it's nice to see some other um scots in not only local ones but adopted ones and people who have the heritage too uh, we're all in great company and i love to see all of these uh, people from elsewhere as well <clears throat> and i've not seen too many people with staffordshire ancestors this time which is interesting i, I thought we had a, quite a good showing of people with staffordshire relatives before but uh, do let me know if i've missed some and uh, yes i see uh, Maz is saying her DNA says 20% Scottish, no Scottish in a tree at all, going back to the great great grandparents at least. And then that wonderful bit of advice always keep going and you'll find it if you keep looking. So it'll be interesting. And uh, Anne said her DNA confirmed her grandfather, grandmother's father. There was not a father on the birth certificate. So that's one of the powers of DNA. Really useful when you can use it, you can triangulate with cousins and you can do everything else. And then you can find things that maybe there aren't a record for. So that's really, really useful as well. Roxanne is rumoured to have Scottish ancestry as well. DNA supports this, but haven't found any records so far. And I like the so far. That's the important thing as well. Uh, Janet's DNA has been quite accurate for her. London, the home counties in East Anglia. Family tale says Welsh married Irish, unproven. Well, let's uh, see. Not all tales uh, have truth in them. Sometimes they can be exaggerated. Sometimes they can come from surprising places. But uh, definitely uh, keep that in mind. Keep it somewhere and see and find out there is any truth in it and by the end of it i see uh, beth does have some staffordshire family connections but needs to do more research so when you do hopefully uh, you can uh, find some ancestors in darlaston willen hall and uh, all wensbury that's another one that i've got plenty of all around there in the black country the niece had staffordshire grindon near leek and uh, there we go so and jill has some staffordshire ancestors black country excellent and her father's side is from uh, Dublin and Ennis Curthy in Wexford. So she's got Irish and Staffordshire. So that's quite a good mix. Uh, I will not say no to that. And uh, we've got lots and lots of great things here. So, uh, and we'll see lots and lots. So Andrea lives in Staffordshire, hasn't found any answers from here yet. Keep looking, I'm sure it will come. It's um, a great thing that we have ancestors from so many different places and with websites like Find My Past. We can look at records from all these different places without having to leave wherever we are. I know that in Edinburgh now, <clears throat> I can possibly go to the National Records of Scotland, look at some Scottish records, which is really useful. But if I want to look at my Staffordshire ancestors or my Cornwall ancestors or my Sicilian ancestors, the only way I can do it really is from the internet at the moment. And that's because, of course, of COVID, but uh, also that convenience, that great thing that I can do this any time of the day or night, as we saw with that 4 a.m. staying up. And, uh, you know, it's really, really useful, really, really important. And, um, and so it can really help to have these things at the touch of a button. I see Mary has McNaughton, Kirkpatrick from Balmaclellan and Penpont area of Dumfries, Jones from Chester and the Coplands from Ennis Curthy as well. So that's interesting. Maybe you have a connection there um, with Angel. And uh, it is a great thing so you're seeing these matches and things here and uh robert's saying their dna suggested a small percentage of german and they finally found that likely connection thanks to find my past that's really exciting 
and uh, it is very very good to see when you can again use dna to prove a hunch or something like that really really helpful so uh, definitely uh, really like that and it seems as i enjoy and i think he's great uh, every week we have a different kind of mix of things that are going on, the different people that are here, different things that we've been talking about. And um, I'm really interested that uh, as we've had big chunks of, as we said, Staffordshire connections or other things, um, they've seen lots and lots of people this time with uh, Dumfries, Case Ness, all these different things, a lot of people from the east end of London. And um, it's great how these new areas, these clumps of people get to talk about their ancestors from these places, uh, get to uh, bring them out of the cupboard and uh, share their experiences. Really, really helpful and really useful. And um, I do hope that some of the people who are mentioning these locations and uh, all these shared locations that you do speak to each other and see if you have any surnames that you can uh, match together and hopefully you can um, find some connections. And even if not, you may have been uh, distant neighbors and neighbors are very close to being just as close as cousins uh, when they've uh, seen the same things. They've probably hung around together, they've spoken and uh, they've definitely got that connection too. So it's quite interesting. And uh, it does give you another way of talking. I know um, Jen Bolden in particular uh, here at Final Past is really into the uh, fan uh, technique, friends and neighbours, and uh, it's uh, very useful to find out a little bit more. And sometimes they can loop back round and help you, so it is very interesting. And uh, I see uh, see Sylvia has a paternal side, London-based, maternal, solidly Lancashire. So she's got two branches there going in, and uh, it's really, really interesting uh, when you do have those different chunks. So it was a great uh, thing that was going around on Twitter, I think. I think I saw it on Facebook too, where there was a little thing you could do in Excel and you could colour in where your ancestors were born and you could make a little spreading out uh, tree, just a direct pedigree of where your ancestors were born. And you can just see the differences of where they come from and uh, see the difference connections, this sort of thing. So that's quite interesting. Maybe we'll have to share something like that on the Farmer Pass forum and see what other people come back with. But it is very, very interesting when we look at the places that people are I see Trisha's gone the other way. She's got Kirkpatrick. She went from Dumfries to Orkney and Caith Ness, and that's where it links to her shearers in Canis Bay. So that's interesting. They've gone uh, north, which is uh, quite exciting. And I see lots and lots of people there um, uh, talking about the tree settings and those places. <coughs> that pencil, Linda, yes, you can edit things. You can clean things up. Um, I like to go through and so just make sure everything is as I like it. I'm a big fan of a neat tree and uh, that uh, is one of the easiest things I, I like to do because it also helps because you've edited people. It will also generate some hints and it will go through in the background and uh, help you with that as well. So it's always worth them, of course, the better your locations are, the more likely it is to match things on a database and it more likely is going to come back with things and those hints as well. So very, very useful. And of course, if you're looking perhaps to use any kind of mapping software and like which you can do, and there are definitely lots of cool things that might appear in the future in relation to things like mapping, then you can definitely uh, go no wrong than uh, having a nice neat ordered tree with nice places and locations as well. So very, very useful, very helpful. Um, Sarah saying she loves fan research. Brilliant way to solve mysteries about missing people and how folk met is very, very exciting and is a useful extra thing here. And um, Fee has said um, her great grandfather Woods married Edith Francis Platt. One of her cousins had a son, Thomas Plant, who went uh, Platt, who went on to marry one of her grandmother Woods sisters. So that's a great um reason why that fan uh, research can really help you you can see those friends and neighbors and see them coming back around looping through and you can find that your family tree becomes more of a, a family web and that's uh, interesting and it happens more often than you might think so that's a big thing to be aware of and to notice uh, particularly in more rural areas and i see lots and lots of people with their um, surnames coming through again hoping for some matches um karen has been looking for the witness to the wedding of a brick wall family same surname hoping it might be a sister mother or at least a cousin witnesses are a great thing to research and they are obviously always closely connected because you've only got a couple of witnesses so you've got to make sure they may they matter and uh, that's why uh, you usually might find a sibling you might find a cousin you might even find a parent 
really useful, especially if you can't get any further. Find out who those people were. Hopefully their name is rare enough. You might find them on a census. You might find some more, but it is really, really useful. And see what we've got here. Lots of people mentioning. Oh, so uh, Ronnie's great-grandmother was born in Bilston. So that's uh, where I've got some relatives, but they live in Stepney. And all eight of her siblings were London-born, traced back to her birth date and found plumbers living in Bilston who appear to be her uncles and their families, but not proved this yet. I would hopefully get hold of their birth certificate from the GRO if you've not got that already and start looking at censuses, start looking at different records and possibly you may have to work forwards to see who disappears from a certain family and then you'll know that will be your family because the people who disappeared to move south, they'll be the ones you're looking at. So uh, that's what I would do for that and it would be hopefully helpful. And uh, I see uh, Linda's also saying they love a marriage witness. They are really useful, really helpful. Definitely a great tip for the day. Make use of marriage witnesses. Every part of a record is helpful. No matter where it is, make a note of it and see what might come back. One of the great things I like on Farmer Pass, when you add a fact, you can add people. You can link people to it, especially if they're on your tree. So you can then create a link and a connection to those people. So whenever there are witnesses and I know who they are, I'll connect them in. So then if I'm going back, I can click on that person and I can go straight to their profile, find out who they are. So I find that very useful and the really helpful extra tip. <clears throat> so as we're running to the end of this, we have a, uh, about four, three or four minutes left. Um, I want to, to just sort of go over. So we've got those great new records. We've got records from uh, Halifax in Yorkshire, school records. We've got some great new Staffordshire Parish records, particularly um, in Tipton, in um, a few other places as well. But uh, let's see, we've got uh, some great uh, Caverswall, Chebsey and Checkley as well. And then some fantastic newspapers, as we always do have some great newspapers, but this time specifically a lot of special interest newspapers. All of those might be useful and helpful to you in your family history journey. But outside of that, we've also talked about those locations, how you can sharpen them up, how you can do more. And uh, that can also help you by generating new hints. And it can also um, just really help to improve your tree. So that's something that I definitely recommend doing. And then it's also good to just take a step back and take a look at all of the places that have been used. And then, you know, those are the places that make you you. They're the places that you can call home. And that's quite an emotional, quite a nice thing to see, especially when you take a look and go, oh, I didn't realize actually that this place was so common in my tree. I, I never thought of that place as a thing. But then I find many, a lot of my family may have ended up there and I never really realized because it was always in the background. Now I know actually oh, that's, that's somewhere I should maybe go and visit. I should put a list out together and see if I can find the addresses, see if I can look in the local archives, see if I can plan a research trip. So it can be really, really helpful. So definitely... Uh, do that and uh, make a note of those wonderful places because they are all what goes into making you you. Um, it's been lovely to be with you. Um, I see that's a great uh, comment there. Um, Ian has 14% Italian DNA, so uh, that's uh, a good one. I'm uh, always happy to uh, meet fellow countrymen, so that's good. So uh, um, fingers crossed you can find the records and things like that as well for that. I see lots of people saying thank you. That's great. And uh, and just saying Tipton will be great. And uh, hopefully I'm definitely going to look at that as well. And hopefully maybe I'll find some of my groves in there. But uh, it's been great to talk to you again. And uh, I love hanging out with you. I think we have our Q&A session on Wednesday. So if you have any questions about... Uh, all the things that we've been doing, uh, maybe about the new Scottish records, maybe about something else, then get prepared and get it ready for Wednesday where I'll be answering anything genealogy related that you can throw in the hour. So have a think, maybe over the weekend, do some family history, see where you get stuck and see if there's anything that we can help with. And it's not just me that answers questions because of course the community is always very helpful too. That Final Pass Forum is a beautiful thing. It's uh, full of very hardworking, very helpful people. And it's also nice just to chill out and uh, enjoy talking about family history because of course our family are usually tired of us talking about it all the time. But we're amongst friends when we go there because we're amongst all of those people that also can't stop talking and thinking about family history, which is one of the best things. So um, it's been great again. And I'm, I'm always honored and grateful that you choose to spend your hour with me, whether it's morning, evening or night. And those people who are here at the uh, crack of dawn, um, special prizes to you. 
and uh, I hope maybe this has uh, set you on the path to sleeping soundly and uh, hopefully you'll be able to get into some research uh, when uh, the sun rises. But definitely thank you so much for coming and I hope to see you again said on Wednesday. Uh, if not on Friday, I believe it may be Jen Baldwin doing Fridays. We have some great records on the way in the next uh, few weeks. So definitely make sure you subscribe to the newsletter or make sure that you, of course, read our Friday's blog, which will always tell you what's coming up, all of the new records, and uh, best of luck with all of the great bits of research that you've got planned for over the weekend or over the week. I can't wait to hear what discoveries you make next time when I see you on a Friday or when I see you on Wednesday as well. Um, there's always plenty to talk about and uh, we're always um, amongst friends here and I, I can't um, be prouder of being able to call you all friends and uh, it's exciting and uh, that we're all together and we're all inside away from those storms and rain although in Edinburgh it seems to have got a little bit sunnier and I hope it has for you too but definitely I hope to see you again and uh, have a great weekend so uh, all I can say now is uh, Good luck. I hope some of you have connected with your locations and surnames. I can definitely see some people talking about it. And uh, fingers crossed, you have to tell me if you do find something new or you do find a connection. And uh, I shall see you later on. In Bokalu.